It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Welcome to the live show. Thank you for downloading the RJ Young Show podcast, wherever it is you get your podcast. And today, there's a couple of things that I want to get into. I made an upload about Ohio State and Maryland being canceled. Go check that out. It's eight minutes of goodness. Also want to direct you to FoxSports.com, where I wrote a piece about USC and the likelihood of them making the playoff and how this schedule for them is setting up kind of nicely for them to get to the Pac-12 championship game, if nothing else. Also, video over on CFB on Fox, where I'm talking about this at some length. So go check that out on their YouTube channel. And yeah, I'm wearing wearing my Billy Bob jersey, Varsity Blues today. No guest today. You just got me today. So uh, deal with it. I start with the headline, because I always do a bad job of this. I... J.T. Daniels, Stetson Bennett, Dwan Mathis, and Georgia's quarterback path forward is anything but known and certain because Kirby Smart continues to just mess with it. So think about Kirby Smart from the standpoint of recruiting, and you can't do a whole hell of a lot better than what he's done since arriving at Georgia, you know, some four years ago. And take a look at who he has been able to recruit. He flipped Jake Fromm from Alabama. And we don't give him much credit for that because Jake Fromm didn't turn out to be all that great fifth-round draft pick, even as Georgia always felt like they were quarterback away, even as Georgia was able to beat Oklahoma in the 2017 Rose Bowl with what I think is the best Oklahoma football team of the Lincoln-Riley era, still just a defense away. But also, he had Jacob Eason on that team. He ends up going to Washington. He gets drafted. He ends up winning the commitment of Justin Fields, who became the first ESPN number one overall player to commit and sign with Georgia after getting into a fierce rivalry with Penn State, among others, to try to get him. Justin Fields, as you know, is not just the quarterback at Ohio State. He's one of the two best players in all of college football, and for my money, the best player in all of college football. He also... Brought in Dwan Mathis, and what I thought was really interesting is Dwan Mathis was going to go to Ohio State. Justin Fields is going to transfer to Ohio State, so they flip. One goes to Georgia, one goes to Ohio State. You end up adding Carson Beck to this 2020 class, who I believe could play in any one of these games that Georgia's played in and give you better production than Stetson Bennett. And you have a commitment from one of the top quarterbacks in this class in Brock Vandegrift and the guy that Lincoln Riley wanted before he was able to land Caleb Williams. And yet and still, Georgia still didn't have a damn quarterback. I'm not sure what we are supposed to take from Kirby Smart not playing the best quarterback, except he just doesn't like dudes. Because as far as we know, JT Daniels is healthy. And this is a JT Daniels who was starting ahead of Keaton Slovis, Matt Fink, and Jack Sears when he was at SC, blows out his ACL. Keaton Slovis ends up taking over the job after Jack Sears ends up transferring, right? He's at Boise State now, battling with Hank Bachmeyer for the starting job over there. And Slovis might have been the third best player on that depth chart. He gets a concussion, takes him out of a top 10 game against Utah. Matt Fink goes and passes for all the yards against Utah, giving Clay Helton the biggest win of his season last year. And we're back with Keaton Slovis and Graham Harrell. And Slovis passed for 381 yards against Marvin Lewis and Antonio Pierce's defense. And what I think is the best defense they're going to face, if not the second best defense in all of the Pac-12. All to say, JT Daniels chose to transfer from SC, not, I don't think, because he couldn't compete and win, but because Georgia was going to be a better opportunity for him to compete and win. So, like, if he stays at USC, I don't think that USC becomes a national championship caliber football team, though that's always on the table because it's SC, it's a blue blood program, and when they recruit well, they're going to be good. And they have an opportunity to recruit well because every kid that grows up in SoCal ends up wanting to go to USC at one point or another. And even in a bad year, he lucks into Brew McCoy and Chris Steele in the same damn year when Brew McCoy and Chris Steele had committed and signed elsewhere. Like McCoy was going to Texas, Steele was at Florida. And he ends up getting them both playing football for him in 2020 this year. Catching passes from Keaton Slovis and, you know, rushing ends like, or I say rushing ends, matching up against the best wide receivers that Arizona State has. And that ain't no small task because the last two best wide receivers that Arizona State has had have been like first round draft picks, right? Brandon Ayuk and, of course, 
Nikhil Harry, who was the first wide receiver that Bill Belichick ever drafted in the first round. Not a small thing. Then there's Eno Benjamin in the back. What I'm saying is, Arizona State's a really good football team, and I thought they should have won that game last Saturday, and it's just the Clayton Helton experience for them to luck up and win that game. But to JT Daniel transferring from SC to Georgia, I thought it was because he thought he was going to start or could beat out Storebrand Cam Newton. Because you'll remember, Storebrand Cam Newton was brought in to be the starting quarterback last January by James Coley. Storebrand Cam Newton was going to be that dude, and then Storebrand Cam Newton decided to opt out in August. There were actual conversations being had about Storebrand Cam Newton deciding to opt out because he's going to get beat out by JT Daniels, even as JT Daniels was not actually fit and healthy to play football. So Storebrand Cam Newton opts out, and we're all expecting to hear that JT Daniels is the starting quarterback, and we see Dewan Mathis trot out there against Arkansas. Dewan Mathis does not look good in the first half. He gets the hook. Stetson Bennett comes in, stabilizes the offense. They go get a win against Arkansas. But let's not forget that Stetson Bennett was a walk-on quarterback at Georgia. And not just a walk-on quarterback at Georgia, uh, like not a great quarterback, the kind of dude that needed to leave to go to JUCO so that he could come back to Georgia, right? Like he needed to actually get sent down to the minor leagues so he could come back to Georgia and be the scout team quarterback. That was the thought. Also, Stetson Bennett was playing Baker Mayfield against Roquan Smith and them leading up to the Rose Bowl, which is going to be a trivia question that only real college football fans know or Georgia fans know. You can't convince me that Stetson Bennett is a better quarterback than JT Daniels. You could probably talk me into that being on the table with Dwan Mathis because I know what kind of an athlete Dwan Mathis is. But Mathis has completed just 40% of his passes this year. So he ain't the passer that JT Daniels is. And let's not forget, Daniels comes out of modern day. The same modern day that won national championships. The Monarchs are an absolute blue blood among high school football. It's the same place that gave us Matt Leinart and Bryce Young and Jeremiah Cradell, right? And the list goes on. Darian Green Warren at Michigan. I can keep throwing names at you to show you just how cold Matter Day is. And for JT Daniels to lead them as quarterback, it's not a small thing. As a matter of fact, there was lots of conversation about JT Daniels and Brew McCoy being that tandem, like, to lead USC into the future. 100%, right? Didn't work out that way because Daniels chose to transfer, even as Brew McCoy was back. But I thought that Daniels going to Georgia meant that they were going to be a national championship caliber football team because they've been a quarterback away for quite literally four years. And it's not because they can't recruit a quarterback. If anything, there's an argument to be made that, yo, Georgia has recruited a better at quarterback than anybody in college football, period. Like, Absolutely anybody in college football, period. And yet and still doesn't know what the quarterback situation is going to look like in 2021. Because now you got a Brock Vandergriff going, wait a second, there's a log jam here. I didn't expect for there to be a log jam when I arrived here. I expect there to be a clean succession plan. Which also means that you're probably looking at not one, not two, but three dudes could potentially transfer as quarterbacks from Georgia if this transfer rule goes through, and even if it doesn't. Like, for JT Daniels, I think he's stuck at Georgia because the law of averages for players that have transferred more than once in their careers does not do him any favors. But for Carson Beck, hell yeah, he can go anywhere he wants. Dewan Mathis probably gets an opportunity to play at a group of five schools as a starter right now or maybe rehabilitate himself at a Power 5 school, right? Where he gets to be more accurate with the football. And then we're talking about what the hell is going to happen with Brock Vandergriff when he gets there. Well, let's say that Kirby Smart goes and pulls in another quarterback. Is Vandergriff one to want to say? Probably not, right? These are all things that I find to be interesting. As a matter of fact, I put only one T in Stetson Bennett's name up here, so I need to go ahead and fix that in the headline because I'm famous for the typos in the headline. So I'm going to ask y'all, like, in the chat, like, what do y'all think about what's going on at Georgia. And for the folks that are continuing to ask in the chat about the Ohio State-Maryland situation, uh, Doc Winston O'Boogie did a, me a service and dropped in the chat the video that I made. So you can go pop into that one and pop back into this one if, if that's what you need to do. Let's see. So, 
RJ, who should Michigan look at when Harbaugh leaves? Would Fickle take the job? All right, so it turns out I actually have something to say about this, but you're going to have to wait till Friday. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I'll say this, though. Jim Harbaugh is not built to withstand a one and two start at Michigan. He's not built to do it, especially in an abbreviated season. His personality, his attitude, they, they don't mesh well with what's going on up there at Michigan. He's eccentric. He's a little bit weird. His dress code kind of freaks us out. He's busting nuts on Bo Beckler's monument. It's just, it's just not, it's not conducive to endearing you to all people. But if you're winning, nobody gives a damn how eccentric you are. Matter of fact, the difference between eccentric and weird is, are you winning? You get to be eccentric if you're winning. You're weird if you're not. Like, Mark Fitterich is eccentric. Talking to himself on the mound when he's winning. He's weird when he's losing games. Steve Carlton can make the same claim. When he's winning 27 of the Phillies' total 59 games, I think it's 1972, 1974, then yeah, absolutely, he's eccentric. But if he were to go 0-27 or 2-27, 26, 20, 25, 2-25, and 25. goodness me, I can't do math. I was an English major. Probably not going to feel that way about him. So what does what does Jim Harbaugh need to do? Well, a win against Wisconsin would certainly help, right? Getting back to 500 would certainly help, especially as the spotlight is going to be on you and Penn State this this weekend because Nebraska feels like they ought to be able to go and get a W against Penn State because Penn State is winless, right? Wisconsin feels like they've been saving up for a couple of weeks to go beat up on Michigan, so that's going to be a little bit tougher task. Plus, Graham Mertz is actually a good quarterback, which means that the corners that Michigan has – Going to have to show that they can shut down at least the Wisconsin wideouts who, you know, ain't been that much to write home about. But they got a tight end that is absolutely the truth. And then we're looking at not just can he can he win that game. Can he go and beat Ohio State? Because I, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm lay it out for you. Jim Harbaugh can go winless the rest of the way through November. Even the first week of December. But if he beats Ohio State, we're all good in Ann Arbor. Nobody's doing nothing. Nobody's going nowhere. He's going to get another year to try to get this thing right with an entirely grown-up group of kids. Like, that's the thing that I don't think a lot of people want to give him an opportunity to figure out is he put four offensive linemen in the draft. He lost 10 to the draft total, and he's having to figure out a new quarterback, probably not the guy that he was going to pick first, though, Maybe it was because Dylan McCaffrey ends up transferring before the season starts. You're trying to figure it out at corner and secondary. You might have to fire Don Brown regardless, right? Bring in somebody else to try to get you right, particularly somebody with a background in the secondary. And you're going to have to settle on a running back because that's the thing that is also just giving me a headache is watching Michigan not be able to run the football when I know that's all Jim Harbaugh really wants to do with his life is run the football, right? So to that question, I, I, I think that you also need to know Jim Harbaugh's buyout. And I wrote it down. His buyout is, oh, no, I didn't write it down. I wrote, it, I wrote down Luke Fickle's buyout. So that tells you a lot about what I think about what's going on over there, to answer your question. But I did write down Tom Herman's buyout, and it's $15.4 million. Will Muschamp's buyout is $13 million. And Jeremy Pruitt's buyout is $12.9 million, which is astronomical, as all these dudes are on the hot seat. And I, I don't get buyout culture being this ridiculous. And yet I have people that don't make nearly that much money trying to tell me that it's perfectly in line with their thinking that these coaches get these enormous buyouts. Because of all the pressure that is put on these coaches. Let me tell you something, dog. If you are a college football coach at a Power 5 school, you have no excuse for not performing. None. Zero. Nada. Zilch. Okay? As a head coach at a Power 5 football school, you don't have to worry about the things the rest of us do. You don't have to say, know when the mortgage gets paid, make sure the electric bill gets paid. You ain't got to make groceries. You ain't got to make sure all the little people got on pants in the morning 
You ain't got to make sure all the little people who you make sure got on pants in the morning get to school in the morning. You ain't got to worry about whether or not the little people have lunch money or lunch is made or picking them up from school. You ain't got to worry about what channel the TV needs to be turned on to find the NCAA tournament that's going to be aired on True TV that one time a year. You ain't got to worry about the garage door code. You ain't got to worry about your address. As a matter of fact, that's my favorite college football day, uh, game day segment of all time. College game day segment of all time. Gene Wojciechowski is talking to Lincoln Riley and Caitlin Riley, but they're not together, right? You sit one down, you interview them. You sit the other one down, you interview them. So at this time, Gene Wojciechowski asked Caitlin, do you know or do you think that Lincoln knows how much a gallon of milk cost. Nope. <laughs> and Lincoln's guessing something like $6. Not in Oklahoma, dog. Not in Oklahoma. About three sixty nine, dollars right? Right, right? right around that three that $3 range. Y'all give you 50 cents either way, okay? Do you think that Lincoln knows the garage door code? Nope. And he doesn't. He's got the garage door opener. Do you think that Lincoln knows your home address? Nope. He gave out the wrong home address just the other day. And Lincoln's like sweating these questions because he feels like he's being punked here. And no, it's not that you're being punked. It's that you ain't never got to worry about this stuff. Matter of fact, Power 5 college football coaches ain't even got to worry about what they're wearing to work. It's the same stuff that the equipment manager's going to lay out for them the day of. You're wearing sweats today. You're wearing a pullover tomorrow. You're wearing sweats the next day. You're wearing a pullover the next day. If you're a visor dude, you're a visor dude. If you're a hat dude, you're a hat dude. If you're not one of those dudes, you ain't got to worry about it. It's less that you got to worry about. You can be Jim Harbaugh and wear spikes to dinner. Wear spikes on a plane. Because we have given you this opportunity to be this kind of dude. I don't think that these coaches should get these sorts of buyouts. I don't think anybody should get that sort of a buyout. But the idea there being, I want to make it difficult for you to fire me so that I can do my job. Art Howe tried to make this argument against or with Billy Bean when he was saying it's really difficult for me to coach the Oakland Athletics on a one-year contract. Why? Because it doesn't show that you have faith in me to turn this thing around and to give me time to go figure out what I'm going to do next with this team. It's like, well, tough. Either you want the job or you don't. Well, I want the job, but I want to know that ownership has my back. We have your back. Well, then give me a contract extension. No. Well, then I don't think you have my back. Okay, then walk. Like, it's, it's like that. I think that that's how most people go through life. Like, most of us ain't working on a five-year deal. Ain't working on a six-year deal. Right? Even with this channel. If I don't show up to work, I don't, I don't get to call y'all, you know, viewers. Simple as that. Not locked into a five-year deal where I'm automatically going to get, I don't know, let's do something arbitrary, like a thousand views. No. You put out the content, if people respond to the content, cool. If they don't, they don't. This is why I don't actually give all that much talk to what's going on in the comments. I used to when it was a smaller room. Now I just feel like people show up just to punk me. And I'm like, all right, I, I ain't got time for that. And I can see how that might be how Jim Harbaugh feels. I don't have time for people to just show up and punk me. Matter of fact, Wright Thompson told another dude with a large Twitter following, because I heard this on Bomani's podcast. Bomani Jones, for you, those of y'all don't know, the right time is really, really good. Anyway, it was quite simply like, why would I want to walk around with 40,000 hecklers in my pocket? That's kind of sometimes how the YouTube comments can feel, certainly how Twitter feels. And just as soon as I can get off of Twitter, I'm getting off of Twitter. It's, oof. it's rough. It's especially rough during election year. And it's still rough because, you know, some people are not ready to succeed, uh, to, to seed the election, that they have lost the election, and yet I'm going, yo, man, isn't this a democracy? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Anyway, let me get back on this other thing. Let's see. Ah, oh, Pastor Walker, he in here. What's the likelihood of the Sooners winning out? Do you see a loss on the schedule in the championship in November? Love you, brother. Keep on keeping on. Appreciate you, Pastor Walker. So, to his question, yeah, I think Oklahoma can win out. Like, an, an amazing stat. I actually wrote about this on OUinsider.com. You should go check that out. Lincoln Riley is 33-0 and against Texas Tech, Kansas, 
Oklahoma State, Baylor, and West Virginia. The last five games on Oklahoma's schedule are Texas, who they beat like they stole something, 62-28. Kansas, who they beat like they stole something, 62-29. Oklahoma State, Baylor, and West Virginia. Like, is set up for Oklahoma to live the charm existence that Oklahoma has lived basically since the dawn of the Lincoln-Riley era in November. They just win in November, and things shake out for them just fine. They needed Ohio State to get beat and run over by an actual train called Purdue, and that happened in 2018. Last year, they needed Oregon to beat Utah in the Pac-12 championship as Oregon lost to Arizona State just the week prior, and it knocked themselves out of contention to play in the playoff with two losses. And that happened. Like, all the things that can go right for Oklahoma continue to go right for Oklahoma. It is one of the luckiest college football programs in the modern era, even as Oklahoma has not won a national championship in 20 damn years. And it, it ain't going to happen this year either. But all to say, yeah, Pastor Walker, they can, they can win out. Probably will. You might see Iowa State or Oklahoma State, or Texas in the Big 12 championship game. And that's where Oklahoma has, you know, ruled. So that, that makes sense too. And then you're looking at a New Year's Six Bowl. You know? It's the Cotton Bowl this year, I think, where Oklahoma would be going if they won the Big 12 championship. And I think the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl are the two playoff uh, spots this year. And I think Miami is where the national championship is being played. Uh, Miami's getting all sorts of stuff. I hate that. Just once. Just just once. Put the national championship game in, I don't know, Des Moines. In the middle of nowhere. Kind of like the College World Series is in Omaha. Just put it put it anywhere. All right. Uh, let's see. Corey Carhoff, Michigan going to be 1-3. They either catch this L against whiskey or catch this L against COVID. I see no lies there. No lies detected. Uh, for those of you that do not know, if you are in the live show, I look for the membership badge first and because that makes it one easier for me to find out who are members. Uh, lots of folks sign up to be members for like 99 cents a month, which is quite literally nothing. It's just, pfft. so you might think about doing that. Uh, Bama voice says, sup guys, roll tide. I mean, it's, it's certainly rolling. It's certainly rolling, right? LSU didn't want to smoke. They did not want to smoke. If everyone in Texas uh, donated $1.34, they could buy out Tom Herman. I don't want to buy out Tom Herman. for You know, you say everyone in Texas like everybody in Texas is a Texas fan. Number one, that ain't true. Number two, there's a ton of Oklahoma fans that would not engage in your buyout that live in Texas. Right? Right? There's a lot of Oklahoma fans living in Texas that people just don't know about or don't care to know about. Houston and Dallas in particular. So that ain't going to work there, homie. That ain't going to work there. You got a, a pocket of Texas Christian fans. You got a pocket of SMU fans. You got a pocket of Baylor fans, ampersand U fans, Houston fans, Baylor fans. Hell, I'm sure Abilene Christian got one or two in the Metro, you know? Let's see us. Uh, how do I sign up? I need to do like a membership drive month at some point. But if you go to the subscribe button on a video like this one, there's a join button just below it. Hit that join button. It'll take you through the steps. Uh, let's see what we got here. Will the Sooners keep Gilliam? Yeah, just because Notre Dame is coming on doesn't mean he's going anywhere. I mean, do you see that man's commitment video? His commitment video is like reaction gold. Like the man opened up his shirt and said, Boomer Sooner, baby. Like, cool. People come on all the time. Like, I remember a couple years ago, there was this wild rumor that Texas A&M was going to flip Spencer Rattler. And Rattler was like, Texas A&M going to do what? Get flipped by Spencer Rattler? Yeah, probably. <laughs> like, nah, man. It's, it's not a flimsy commitment. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Ghost think. Da, 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 da. Nope. 
Notre Dame winning the natty talk. Notre Dame, no one wants to hear anything else. I mean, first of all, come back at 5 o'clock. Second of all, this ain't exactly been like a Notre Dame fan site. Like, there's a lot of OU fans here. There's a lot of Ohio State fans here. There's a few Georgia fans. A few LSU fans begrudgingly just show up to heckle me because I told them they're going to catch five losses and they're going to catch five losses. Like, there's just not that many ND dudes that, that hang out over here. I don't know. Maybe they, they smell work ethic on me and, and they run away. You know, I give off this, this funk of a man that works for a living and Notre Dame fans just go running the other direction. Kudos, though. You know, you beat Clemson and then you caught COVID. Who are you? Why? What have we said? We have said, don't you dare storm the damn field just because you finally beat Clemson. Clemson. All right, I get the Clemson for the last five years has been a juggernaut. It's also Clemson. Now we got 10,000 kids rushing onto a doggone football field in Notre Dame Stadium to give their entire football team the COVID and try to make it almost impossible for these boys to go and get beat down by Boston College this week. Like, it's going to be shocking to me if Notre Dame beats Boston College this week by more than two touchdowns because Boston College, number one, is a good football team. Phil Jerkovec got it like that. And number two... I would not be surprised to find out Notre Dame is down dozen, half dozen players against Boston College because they caught the COVID because Notre Dame fans decided they want to get down there and start hugging on people at a time when you know everybody got the cooties. And you've seen the cootie outbreak since Halloween because y'all don't believe fat meat is greasy and you got to go to these Halloween parties and you got to show out. Now we got grown ass men talking about, I feel bad for these kids. These kids just want to play football. These kids went to the party. They went to the parties. They went to the parties. They decided to go and try to play with herd immunity, which is stupid. And you shocked that they coming up positive. You shocked that you losing games with Texas A&M, Tennessee, LSU, Alabama. You know, Nick Saban actually had a really good point that he made earlier today, which is when, he, when his kids go home over the weekend, I trust my family. I think they trust their family. But you don't know about Uncle Tommy. <laughs> to which I say, yep, Cousin Eddie does not wear a mask. Cousin Eddie ain't afraid of no virus. And Cousin Eddie is coming to Thanksgiving whether you invite him or not. Cousin Eddie gonna be there. Cousin Eddie gonna get it in. I'm trying to tell y'all. Let me see. Uh, missed the super chat from uh, Ghost. Says, Georgia sucks, hate you, cheer for a loser, talk Irish. All right, dude, take your money back. Take your money back. I mean, you can't just keep using a billboard for $2 to, to come out here and, and make stuff. Matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and put you in timeout. You just, you just being ridiculous. <sighs> Clemson is new booty. I don't know that they new booty. They, they, they new money. I don't think that you and I agree on what new booty means. I mean, somebody in here hasn't watched Oz. Um, the championship this year going to be Bama versus OSU versus Clemson. Everyone else doesn't stand a chance. I mean, that's been the thing about the playoff, right? We can identify three really good teams and the four teams just kind of there. Usually Oklahoma has been that four team. All right, cool. How is that going to be any different than any other year? As a matter of fact, that kind of comforts me because nothing has been the same this year, right? I would love for Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State to make the playoff because those would be the three best teams according to most people's eyes. And that would also mean that we get to see a national champion crown. It's wild and interesting right now, though, that people are talking about moving the college football playoff dates because we're not getting enough games. I'm like, we're getting plenty enough games. Greg Sankey actually made that, uh, that point, which is, to add more teams to the playoff is to make the playoff harder to complete, right? And they were like, well, are you worried about the SEC not getting enough credit? And he's like, one thing I am not worried about is the kind of respect an SEC schedule provides. Like, thank you telling no lies there. Everybody 
is all in on the SEC schedule. If for no other reason than we have data to show, y'all are all in on the SEC schedule because those teams also end up being pretty damn good, right? We all raised holy hell in 2017 when we found out that Georgia and Alabama were making it into the playoff because we were like, we don't want another rematch of the conference championship, which ended up being the national championship, which ended up being a really great game. You can look at Tua Tagovailoa coming off the bench to go win that game for Georgia. You can look at Georgia not being able to finish because that is the second time in four years for which I have seen a quarterback totally torch Georgia's defense. And Kirby Smart needs to start looking at Dan Landing going, yo, man, do I need to take over the controls again? Or maybe just hand him a Glenn Schumann. Yes, I read that column by Stuart Mandel too, Corey which is to say that if you move the dates back, you're competing with the NFL, and the NFL is going, going to eat you alive. January 1 is the date. January 1 is also the only date where you can have a doubleheader that anybody cares about college football because we're the smallest sport to the NFL, which probably means I need to be start talking more about the NFL, quite honestly. And I should do that. I could do that today. We might do that here in just a minute. Take a look at y'all questions. See if y'all questions are any good. Let's see. RJ, who is the next recruit to come, Wheaton or Tristan Lay? It ain't going to be Tristan Lay. Uh, we'll see about Wheaton. Uh, do, do, do. What else? Yo, man, check out these people that come in the middle of the stream talking about, did I already talk about X? Rewind the button! My God! How much, how much time does it take for you to go rewind the button or just... Finish this one and then go hit the rewind button. It ain't like these are going anywhere. I put them up in segments anyway. Come on, man. Stop that. My goodness. How much more time does it take for you to type that out than to just go rewind the button? Let me see. Some of y'all questions are not good. Yeah, some of y'all, some of y'all's questions are not good. <sighs> nah, that one ain't good either. National championship game. This is Florida versus Bama in the SEC championship. Go. I mean, the same Florida that got beat by Texas A and M. That Florida. The same Texas A and M that Alabama dropped fifty two on and gave up seventeen two. That Florida. That, that Texas ain't now? Nah, man. That ain't going to be no game. Alabama going to run rough shot over Ampersand U. Death, taxes, and Nick Saban being competitive as all hell at Alabama. It's, it's wild. It's straight up wild. Meanwhile, it's going to, like, I'm going to be watching Arkansas, Florida because it's probably going to be the only game on that, that is, you know, hadn't been canceled due to the COVID. But I also would love to see Barry Odom win that game as an interim head coach after getting fired from Missouri for making them bowl eligible. <laughs> get fired from Missouri, get put on at Arkansas, making, I think, more at Arkansas than he did at Missouri as defense coordinator. Watch Sam Pittman catch the COVID, got to sit at home, and then Barry Odom, Felipe Franks, Kendall Bryles, and the like, go and get themselves a dub against Dan Mullen and the Gators. It's not likely to happen, but I'm here for it happening. That would be so much fun. He's so much fun. Um, let's see. What else we got in here? Uh, okay. All right, dude. I'm going to do it again. And the next time, I'm going to remove you from the stream. Talk about something else. All right. That's why you've been putting time out. Also, it's 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 so disrespectful that YouTube allows us to put people in time out. Like it's actually called time out. Like it says timed out for 300 seconds, which is, you know, five minutes. It's actual time out. It's like elementary school time out. That's where we live. <laughs> because this 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 platform is just full of trolls. Full of trolls. One day I'm gonna have to tell y'all about what YouTube has been doing over the last six weeks. Not today, but at some point, I'm going to tell y'all that story, and it's going to blow your mind. I bet Georgia drops another game. It's possible. Like, Georgia's 
Georgia's real weak at finishing stuff when they don't feel like they got anything to play for. See Texas in the Sugar Bowl. Like, as soon as Georgia feels like they're out of contention for something, they stop showing up. It's just like that. Like, George Pickens had something to prove in the Sugar Bowl against Baylor last year, and Baylor wasn't that good. Well, yeah, they... Whew. Why Oregon started the wrong quarterback? Nah, man, like, Tyler Shuck, been there for years. I'm with that. Plus, Joe Moorhead is really good at calling offensive football. So let's, you know, let's keep it 100 on that front. That dude knows what it is. You know, that dude knows what it is. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm with that. All right, let's talk a little bit about another sport. So I know that some of y'all only show up here for college football, and that's fine, but I want to talk about something else. So, oh, Harden and Westbrook are unsure about the direction of the Rockets. Forgive me, I just saw that story. I'll have to go do some research on that story before I talk about it. But man, that's wild. I went here looking for something else entirely. Mel Kuyper was talking about his big board, right? This is my NFL crossover. And I thought it was interesting that Kuyper was saying, it's no longer unanimous that Trevor Lawrence is the number one overall pick. There are people that believe that Justin Fields should be the number one overall pick. What we do know is that the Jets still got it. And if you don't want to play for the Jets... Tell them not to draft you because the, the draft, you can take a leave as far as I'm concerned. But looking at Kuiper's big board, he still got Trevor Lawrence at number one on it, right? He's actually moved fields up from three to two because Sewell was at two. But Sewell hasn't been playing football, and that's, I think, the reason that he's sliding. But he makes a good point about Trevor Lawrence, which is in six games, Lawrence has improved his completion percentage to 70.7%, and he has 17 touchdown passes to just two interceptions. Those are like Justin Fields' numbers from last year, quite honestly. And he looks good, and he looks good without Justin Ross, which I think is the best thing that could happen to him. And as far as his draft stock is, you can look around and say he doesn't have the best wide receiver available to him or would be available to him if he had not had the kind of surgery he needed to miss the year. But he still has Amari Rodgers. He still has Joseph Ngata. He's still got Travis Etienne, as bad as Travis Etienne has been running the football the last couple of weeks. And Cornell Powell is beginning to blossom into a real threat down the field. Meanwhile, Justin Fields has been ridiculous. 13 touchdowns this man is responsible for. He's thrown just 11 incompletions all season. 86.7% of his throws are completions. Also add to that, you know, the two rushing touchdowns. So he's really got as many passing touchdowns as he does incompletions which is just stupid I want the Atlanta Falcons to do whatever is possible to go get Justin Fields and hire Eric Bieniemy because I would love to see Chocolate City just getting it in like that because I feel like Atlanta gets a- a- Atlanta's miserable Atlanta's miserable like the Falcons franchise is miserable basically since Mike Vick because Mike Vick made that awesome Mike Vick and Algie Crumper and work done made them awesome Add Roddy White to the mix a little bit later on, right? It's fun. It's a lot of fun. And it ain't been fun for the last few years. Like 28-3, we still remember, right? We don't think of that as the Patriots winning. We think of that as the Falcons losing. But Biennemi, who has been passed over for jobs that he should have had even last year, also is going to be able to help you get a draft incentive because the NFL actually approved this. They're going to give incentives to teams for the draft that hire and develop minority coaches and front office personnel. Which gives Arthur Blank every reason to go and try to hire Eric Bieniemy to be his full-time head coach. Even as I understand that Raheem Morris is, is his interim, but that ain't necessarily a good look. You know, going down the draft board, you still got Jamar Chase at number six. Kyle Pitts moves to seven. Like, Kyle Pitts actually has a—he's listed as a tight end because he's 6'6", 239, but like, Calvin Johnson's that big. I look at Calvin Pitts, I'm going, why not just reclassify the wideout? You'll make more money. Like, that's where I would want to get drafted. I would want to work out with the wide receivers because that's also where Dan Mullins is lining him up. He's lining him up on the numbers and letting that man eat. 17.3 yards per reception. Those are wide receiver numbers. He's a top 15 overall draft pick before this season started, and after his destruction of the Southeastern Conference, 
He's my wide receiver one, ahead of Jamar Chase, who's 6'1", 200. Short, fast dude. I like short, fast dudes. I like short, fast dudes that caught 1,780 yards receiving last year and 20 touchdowns. I also like short, fast dudes that destroyed first-round draft pick A.J. Terrell. But I like Kyle Pitts better. I can throw the football anywhere on the football field to Kyle Pitts. He coming down with it. He's that cold. And what he did to Georgia, my God, right? Like, <sighs> if not for the concussion, it probably goes for 200 yards receiving. Somebody still, like, somebody being Ky- Mel Kuyper, still got Trey Lance's number eight overall on the draft board. But I think he's going to fall into that Jordan Love tier of getting drafted because I, you, you can't draft him and expect to play him right away. He's got to have the Julian Love or Jordan Love experience. Jul- Julian Love is a cornerback. Patrick Tain at 9, Sam Cosme at 10, Jalen Waddle at 11. There's a short, fast dude that you might actually take before you take Jamar Chase based on what he can do for you in the return game and that he fits the Tyreek Hill prototype a little bit more easily than perhaps Jamar Chase does, right? Zach Wilson, 13th on the draft board ahead of Sean Wade. I know Sean Wade ain't been off to a great start, but that ain't necessarily good, dog. Like, that's not, nah, Terrence Marshall at 21, eh. Wyatt Davis at 22, Rondell Moore at 23, that's cold. 24, Mac Jones? All right, we need to have us a good conversation about Mac Jones at some other point, but the A.J. McCarron comp, he's going to have to overcome that. I think that he's good. I don't know that he's as good as Joe Burrow was, but his numbers say that he is. I don't know that he's as good as Tua Tagovailoa is, but his numbers say that he is. Yeah, man. Like, it's it's weird, you know? See, Doc Winston, oh, biggie, already getting in. All right, Doc, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this easier on everybody. Appreciate you for staying up on that, Doc. Uh, Kyle Pitts should be the first pass catcher, to be honest. Yeah, no, 100%. And I really want him to get, be reclassified as wide receiver because he'll make more money. Like, that's the way that the scale goes. They don't pay tight ends nearly as much as they should. Though, Travis Kelsey, for me, is more valuable than Tyreek Hill. Because there ain't no Ty- there ain't no Travis Kelsey's just walking around out there. I can find a short fast dude. Might not be able to find him with the kind of world class speed that Tyreek Hill has, but I don't need them to be as fast as Tyreek Hill. I just need them to be faster than you. Like people forget, the coldest slot receiver that Tom Brady ever had was a short fast dude, not Wes Welker, and it's not Julian Edelman. It's Dion Branch. Okay, Dion Branch was the oldest and people forget that like he's the precursor to all the short fast dudes that you talk that you remember right let me see uh cowboys would absolutely tra- trade up to go get trevor lawrence i don't know about justin fields because uh, marketing as much as i hate that because i would love to see justin fields with a star on Let's see uh what else you got in here wonder if kennedy brooks comes back i doubt it I doubt it. Let's see. Let's see. What did Randy Jackson want to get my take on? I don't know. If we get Florida versus Bama in the SEC championship game, what do you think? I think Bama's going to mop the floor with them. Straight up. Full stop. I picked Alabama to win the national championship in January, dog. Hello? That was with Mac Jones and Bryce Young at quarterback. That's how I feel about about one Alabama. See, Mike Par- Michael Parsons is the co best defender in the draft. No, he's not. Might be the best pass rusher in the draft. He's not the best defender in the draft. I still think the best defender in the draft is a corner, right? There's a reason why Jeff Akuda went number three overall. Plus, I sit on the selection committee to pay Jim Thorpe Ward. I believe defense backs beat all. If I got somebody that can take away your best wide receiver, your best pass catcher, I can beat you. That's what Darrell Rivas did for like an entire career. That's what Champ Bailey did for an entire career. That's what Stephon Gilmer did last year to win Defensive Player of the Year. It wasn't a pass rusher. It wasn't Khalil Mack. It wasn't Aaron Donald. It wasn't J.J. Watt. It was doggone Stephon Gilmore with New England. That's how cold they were. And they were so cold that through the first half of the season, we were talking about the New England Patriots as being one of the best defenses of all time because Stephon Gilmore took away one side of the football field. Like, don't don't come at me with no Michael Parsons, the best defender. He's good. He ain't ain't no DB. 
Nah, man, Patrick Sertain is going to be up there. Uh, Sean Wade need to get it together because I got to put together my, my semifinalist list here in like a couple of weeks, and I'm I'm really staring at Sean Wade going, you got to show me something because I, I, don't, I don't see it right now, dog. Like Richard LeCount, cold. Been so cold this year. Man, like I was riding so hard for J.R. Reed last year because he was cold, and Richard LeCount said, no, nah, I got this. You might actually see a third straight year of a Georgia defensive back being on the finalist list because he's so cold, right? And you know what it is with Patrick Sertain. There, there are folks that think that he's another Marlon Humphrey. Could be. Could be. If he just turns out to be another Patrick Sertain, I'll be with that because there are people that are old enough, myself included, that remember Patrick Sertain is the best player to ever come out of Southern Miss, period. Brett Favre, not the hell with Brett Favre. Patrick Sertain would have been picking off Brett Favre left and right. Patrick Sertain was the truth, was the absolute truth. And I love more that Patrick Sertain straight up punked Ed Orgeron. Just straight up punked him. I thought that was the funniest thing of all time. Let me see. Uh, let's see. What else we got? J.C. Jackson, Ice Code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where do you think Mac Jones might get drafted? I don't know. He's going to go in the first round. He's not getting the same sort of recognition that Joe Burrow was. But right now, it's Justin Fields or Trevor Lawrence and number one. And we're talking about flavor at this point. And I, I like the Justin Fields flavor better than I like Sunshine. Right? After that, is Mac Jones a better quarterback than Trey Lance? That's a real question. That's a real question we don't know the answer to, right? And I've demonstrated this before, but Ben DiNucci played against Trey Lance in an after championship game in January, was drafted in the seventh round in April, and got hammered against Philadelphia in October. No, November. In November. Like, the margins are really that thin. So I'm not prepared to say that Mac Jones is even better quarterback than Trey Lance. And y'all already think, uh, y'all already know, I don't think that Trey Lance is the first half of the uh, of the draft kind of quarterback. I just don't see it. You know, and as the draft order gets set, we'll see. You know, Kyle Trask is also in that Mac Jones category. Look, he's been really good this year. He was pretty decent last year. But the thing that always bothers me is that he didn't beat out Felipe Franks to start the 2019 season. And he could never be out De'Aaron King at Manville to start in high school. And one of the rules that I tell all the kids that want to be recruited is, you got to be the best player on your high school football team. I don't care if De'Aaron King is on your high school football team. You need to find a way to be playing football and demonstrate that you're the best athlete on your football team. Now, De'Aaron King is also cold, right? But would you put De'Aaron King in the first round ahead of Kyle Trash? You would if he played at Florida. That's my point. So much of this conversation is having to do with where these dudes played and not the players they are. Because three years ago, two years ago, we're talking about De'Ara King having 3,000, 1,000 a year and putting up 50 touchdowns at Houston. 50 touchdowns. He's, he's leading a one-loss Miami team. They're 6-1. and one. Their one loss is to the national runner-up and the lord of the ACC, Clemson. Like, Miami is there, but y'all are talking about Kyle Trask in a way that makes me uncomfortable because if you watch De'Aaron King play football, you'll have De'Aaron King be your quarterback before you pick Kyle Trask. You want the best athlete available playing quarterback, especially if that dude's accurate throwing the football. Nah, man, like that's the, that's the thing where I'm getting at with Mac Jones and Trey Lance. Is he a better quarterback? I don't think so, but I don't know. Let me see. Why did I comment and I'm 15 minutes behind the video? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Why did you? Let's see. Uh, Parsons is a pass rusher, dog. Am I really going to have to walk this out for people that don't know? Okay. All right. Mike Parsons is six foot three, 245 pounds. For starters. For starters. Okay. Mike Parsons... Had 191 tackles over two seasons. I get that. He also had six and a half sacks and 19 tackles for loss. He is not a linebacker in the way that Kenneth Murray is a linebacker. 
He is a 3-4 outside backer. That's what he is. He is a pass rusher. He is a stand-up nine. He is not a middle of the defense, read keys, go to flow, and fill. That's not who he is. He is screaming off the edge and destroying your quarterback. He is blowing up your running back. He is running through your left tackle into the backfield. That's what he is. Not a linebacker. He's a pass rusher. Somebody in here going to be like, he didn't say Devontae Smith when he's reading off these names. You're right, I didn't. Um, What else we got in here? All Haskins did at Ohio State was throw crossing routes. I mean, I was I also did not tell y'all to draft Dwayne Haskins in the first round. I did not tell you to do that. I don't know who y'all were listening to, but like if you see the Dwayne Haskins experience as an arbinger for the Kyle Trask Mac Jones experience, I would say that we think alike. Just gonna throw that. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Dudes be in the chat quite literally looking up stats to drop them in here. <laughs> okay. Um, Ohio State defense ain't looking very strong. Eh, secondary ain't looking very strong. I still love those linebackers. I love those linebackers, man. I wish they could, could figure it out. Because, like, Baron Browning, Tough Borland, Pete Werner, I mean, it ain't exactly, you know, Brian Cushman, Clay Matthews, and Ray Malaluga, but it's close. It's close. Like, it's the last time that I've learned all three linebackers in, like, a 4-3 scheme in years. <laughs> in years, because they're that cold. Let's see. Is Mac Jones actually throwing dimes, or is he throwing to Devontae Smith, John Mechie, Slade Bolden? Like, is that what's happening? Amari Cooper was catching passes from A.J. McCarron. Which one of those guys is the better NFL player? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Let me see. Let's see what else we got in here. Trying to get us toward the end of this. What do you think about the Vols QB situation? I think Harrison Bailey needs to get out there and make it happen. It's kind of like the Kirby Smart situation. But you also got... You got you got Cheney calling the offense, right? I'm not a big Cheney fan. If if Quarantano wants him to be there, the or he wants him to be his starting quarterback, then let it be. Did you see the kind of early production that Herbert in his first year? Yeah, same kind of early production Cam Newton had. None of y'all like him neither, right? I love Cam Newton, but every time y'all want to talk about Herbert, the dudes that he's actually throwing stats with is Cam Newton. Same people in this chat can't stand Cam Newton. Yeah, so I'm going to need every time you say Justin Herbert's name this year to throw Cam Newton's name up there in front of it. Because it's really talking about, you know, in the same way that people talk about Henry Aaron and you always have this trump card that's called Willie Mays. That's what it is. Cam Newton is Willie Mays in this argument. Justin Herbert is Henry Aaron in this argument. Both of them might actually end up wearing gold jackets. But don't get it twisted. He is following in the footsteps of one Cam Newton, not the other way around. Keep it 100. Let's see. How do you think about Zach Wilson? I don't. Ty Detmer. That's what I think. Goodness me. Let's see. Simple game plan, yada, yada. Hey, RJ, do you look at Mac Jones as an outside pocket passer? Like, if team pressures him a lot, is he going to fold? First, get past the offensive line, so we don't really know. But if you can't beat the blitz, you're not going to make it in the NFL. Thank God the Dolphins stood clear of that. <laughs> Dolphins look pretty smart with Tua Tagovailoa right now. They look pretty smart. Let me see. My Seminoles look dreadful. Did you hear about Terry and Blackman leaving the program? Yeah. I mean, Mike Norvell's first year has not been a banner one. Not been a banner one. Plus, you know, you put James Blackman on the bench and you put out a dude that was rushing for more yardage than he was throwing for and had a bad arm in your biggest upset win of the game, you know, or of the season, excuse me. I can see that. That makes sense to me. 
All the Seminoles jumping off the Titanic. LMAO. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. Florida State going to be bad for another few years. Florida versus Miami in the Orange Bowl. No. I would I would I would love to see it, but no. You know why? Because the loser of the ACC championship game is going to the Orange Bowl. That's why. You're looking at Clemson versus uh oh man. Versus Florida, right? That's what you're looking at. You can't get Florida and Miami in the Orange Bowl because they cut both coming out of the ACC, dog. Like, come on now. Think about that. Cam and Deshaun are the best quarterbacks I've seen in 10 years. After that, Kyler and Tua. Kyler's a better quarterback than Deshaun Watson, dog. It's not close. Kyler's a better everything than ever everybody. If we're talking about athleticism, we're talking about quarterback play, we're talking about whatever it is. I know that there are Houston Texas fans that be like, yo, man, Deshaun Watson been working without an offensive line for like three years. Yeah, he also hold the ball, right? That was my knock against Kyler last year as a rookie. He held the ball. Deshaun Watson still holding the ball three years later. You know, just got his extension. So I'm going to need him to do a little bit more. Do you think Baylor had higher expectations for this year? I hope not. You got a brand new coaching staff. You got Charlie Brewer on his 15th concussion. I hope not. You lost your entire defense. I hope not. You lost Defensive Player of the Year in the conference. I hope not. Is Matt Campbell worth the hype? Asking for a Michigan fan. Yeah. Matt Campbell is 100% worth the hype. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you a story about Matt Campbell to end this on. So, Matt Campbell, Alex Grinch, and Jason Toledo, or Jason Toledo, Jason Candle, who coaches Toledo, all went to Mount Union back when Mount Union was unstoppable. Something like 100 straight wins without a loss. Won national championships. Coming out of Maslin, Ohio, Matt Campbell was a highly regarded defensive end. Ends up at Pittsburgh. Didn't like it after the first year. Driving home, he passes a bunch of dudes in gray t-shirts and shorts that are jogging along the highway. They got Mount Union football on those t-shirts. And he decided after watching that, he wanted to be a part of whatever it is they got going on. So he went from playing D1 to play in D3, turns himself into an All-American, but not before having a conversation with Larry Karras about what it meant to play at Mount Union. Larry Karras said, and this is a recruiting pitch to most dudes, make a fist with your hand. Take that fist, drive it into the concrete below, and grind your fist against it. If you can imagine doing that, you can play football for me. That is the man that molded Alex Grinch into a safety. Matt Campbell into an All-American defensive end. And turned out Jason Candle at Toledo. Matt Campbell does not suffer fools. Matt Campbell is here to win. Matt Campbell is here for fundamentals. If Michigan decided to get up off of Harbaugh. And they want to take a swipe at Luke Fickle. I wouldn't blame him. But Matt Campbell is going to end up playing or coaching at a big Power 5 football program sooner rather than later. I don't give a damn what the buyout is. Because that man is looking to get W's. And that man is looking to knock off legends. Okay? He's doing stuff at Iowa State they have never done. Okay? He's the first head coach in Iowa State history to beat every single team in the Big 12 Conference. He took the number two player in Kansas, the best running back in Kansas, and has turned him into a Dope Walker Award finalist named Brees Hall. Brees Hall is in the same stratosphere as Najee Harris running the football. Brees Hall is doing more running the football at Iowa State than Travis Etienne at Clemson. That's what Matt Campbell has done in a very short amount of time. Keep that in the back of your head as we continue to talk about Matt Campbell. Uh, big country, I talked about Arkansas earlier in the show. And you know what? If you didn't list, if you didn't catch the show, subscribe to the podcast, the RJ Young Show podcast. There's a link in the description below where you can find it, wherever it is you get your podcast. I would appreciate it if you leave a five-star review, trying to charge toward 300 ratings over there on the RJ Young Show podcast. I enjoy it. It's fun. I also enjoy these live streams. I appreciate it for y'all for being here. If you are here, please hit the like button 
My man Doc Winston O'Boogie is always trying to get y'all to hit that like button. I appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel. All right? You know what I mean? All right. That is it for me. Doses.